The US-China Cold War has already started. Are the US and China headed for a Cold War? The US-China confrontation is not another Cold War. These are just some of the headlines you'll see in various articles, essays, and think pieces discussing a potential Cold War between the US and China, or the Cold War 2.0, as some publications have labeled it. So, which one is it? As it turns out, it only took one balloon to get a definitive answer to the question. We are, of course, referring to the infamous Chinese spy balloon shot down off the coast of South Carolina by the US Air Force. What followed can only be described as mass hysteria. After all, many still remember the effects of a similar aircraft, the U-2 spy plane, on provoking record high tensions between the US and Soviet Union in the Cold War 1.0, if you will. Though the media storm surrounding the incident caused a lot of chaos, one thing was perfectly clear, a Cold War between the nations already exists. It might not be a repeat of THE Cold War, but it's a Cold War nonetheless. But how did we get here, and more importantly, how will the situation develop? Are we headed towards certain death and destruction, or is there a way to defuse the growing tensions? That's what we're here to discuss. Let's start with where it all began, although this might be easier said than done. You see, one of the defining characteristics of a Cold War is that there is no formal declaration of war. With a hot war, it's relatively simple. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand caused World War I, while the Nazi invasion of Poland sparked World War II. And with a Cold War, things aren't as clear-cut. The supposed beginning of such a war can only be perceived retrospectively by examining past incidents between the opposing countries. So that's precisely what we'll do. But let's get one thing clear before we start. The US and China have been circling each other for decades. So the complete timeline of major incidents between the countries is quite a tangled web, filled with diplomatic tensions, economic competition, and strategic maneuvering. Though much ink has been spent debating when the Cold War between the US and China officially started, we can all agree on one thing. The nations have historically not seen eye to eye on numerous important issues. In fact, one of those first issues was the very establishment of the People's Republic of China, or the PRC, in 1949. This declaration came on the heels of a long and tumultuous civil war, which ended with the peasant-backed communists led by Mao Zedong defeating the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. Now, if you had to guess, which side do you think the US was backing at the time? Yeah, the losing side. Even after the founding of the PRC, the US didn't change course. It supported Chiang's exiled Republic of China government in Taipei, Taiwan's capital city. According to many experts, this was the move that irreparably damaged the relationship between the US and China, setting the stage for several decades of deep mistrust and animosity between the nations. Interestingly, Taiwan will remain at the center of this geopolitical tension for decades to come. But for now, let's run through some of the initial flashpoints that escalated the rivalry between the US and China. In 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower lifted the US Navy blockade of Taiwan, allowing Chiang Kai-shek to deploy over 70,000 troops to the Taiwan Strait a year later. Perceiving this as a provocation, the People's Republic of China responded by shelling Kenmen and the Matsu Islands, where the troops were stationed. The PRC did so despite being warned against the move by the US, and even worse, the shelling killed two US military advisors in the process. In November of that same year, the PRC's People's Liberation Army bombed the Tachin Islands, renewing the Cold War fears of a communist expansion in Asia. Though initially the US signed the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty in December 1954, this didn't prevent the country from threatening a nuclear attack on China as early as April of the next year. Given how pivotal nuclear weapons were in the first Cold War, it's easy to see why many think the current US-China relations as its second iteration. But the threat had seemingly done the job. The People's Republic of China agreed to negotiate, leading to a ceasefire in May 1955. But of course, all the fundamental issues remained to brew just below the surface, leading to new crises just a few years down the road. In 1959, the Tibetan people decided they'd had enough of the Chinese rule, initiating a widespread uprising in Lhansa, the region's capital. Though the uprising started off as a series of peaceful protests, it quickly turned violent as the PRC forces cracked down on protesters killing tens of thousands in the process. Once again, the US was on the side that the People's Republic of China perceived as hostile, reportedly helping arm and train Tibetan resistance. As you can imagine, that didn't go down well with the PRC's leadership. What also didn't go down well was the US's increased involvement in the Vietnam War following the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident, where US destroyers were attacked by the Vietnam People's Navy, or the North Vietnamese Navy as it was called at the time. In response, China amassed troops along its border with Vietnam, 
But the escalation didn't stop there. China conducted its first test of the atomic bomb around the same time in October 1964. And just like that, nuclear weapons are back in the picture amid rising US-China tensions. As the 16 kiloton bomb exploded at the Lopnur facility in Inner Mongolia, so did the fear of what the country could do with such a powerful weapon. The US, who believed that China didn't have the capacity to build a nuclear weapon, scrambled to understand how the weapon came to be. One of the theories was the Soviet Union supplied the necessary uranium to China. To say that possibility was alarming to the US was a severe understatement, as it would occur during a period of unprecedented tensions between that country and the communist bloc. Luckily for the US, or thanks to the US if you ask China, the Sino-Soviet split was underway. The two communist superpowers primarily clashed over ideology, leading to a gradual deterioration in relations, culminating around 1969. Though the Sino-Soviet relations would normalize in 1989, the same year brought about another event that would have the opposite effect on the Sino-American relations, the student demonstrations in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. In a move that comes as no surprise to anyone who's learned about what we've talked about thus far, the CCP responded with excessive violence, clearing the square and killing hundreds of protesters, many of whom were students in the process. Again, no surprise here, but the barbaric move led to the US government freezing relations with China and even suspended the sale of military goods to Beijing. The situation wasn't made any better by the 1999 bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade by NATO during its campaign against Serbia. Though both NATO and the US claimed the bombing was an accident and even offered apologies, the incident had shaken the already strained Sino-American relations. The same could be said for the 2001 collision between a US reconnaissance plane and a Chinese fighter that resulted in the death of a Chinese pilot and the 12-day detention of the US crew consisting of 24 members. If all these incidents are keeping you on the edge of your seat, we can't blame you. Sure, you probably know no hot war ensued, but the constant edging toward it is no less anxiety-inducing. So let's cool things off a little bit and go back to the good old Cold War tactics. The year is 2011, and US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has just published an essay outlining the US's plans to pivot its focus toward Asia. Clinton in the US saw this as increasing diplomatic, economic, and strategic engagement with the continent. China saw it as a direct attack on its growing influence in the region. A similar move that China proclaimed to be rash and unfair came in 2012. At the time, the US, Japan, and the European Union initiated a dispute resolution case against China at the World Trade Organization over its export restrictions on rare earth minerals. The US claimed that this was all part of the process of securing its energy future, but this is not how it was interpreted across the Pacific. China, on the other hand, perceived it as an attempt to counter its dominance in the global rare earth market and maintain a strategic advantage in the global tech sector. Sino-American relations would only worsen after 2013 when Xi Jinping was elected the President of the People's Republic of China. In his inaugural address to the Central Committee, he called on the party to prepare for a long period of cooperation and conflict between the PRC and developed Western nations in the economic, technological, and military spheres. And boy was he right. Though President Xi Jinping mentioned the word cooperation in his address, the subsequent period was undoubtedly marked by the latter, more insidious word, conflict. Let's do a quick rundown. 2014, the US indicted five Chinese nationals on charges of intellectual property theft from US companies, leading Beijing to suspend its participation in the US-China Cybersecurity Working Group as a response. 2015, China continued its controversial island-building activities in the South China Sea, which is precisely what President Xi promised he wouldn't do during his visit to Washington. 2016, Donald Trump was elected US president, marking a shift toward a harder line on China. From here, there's no longer one major incident per year or even every few years. Under President Trump, this figure rose to a few incidents per year. That's why many experts see 2016 as the, quote, official start of the US-China Cold War. Now you might be thinking, how much worse could it really get? Well, trust us when we say, it got much worse. The year 2018 marked the beginning of the so-called China-US trade war. This economic conflict between the nations was a consequence of the Trump administration's imposition of tariffs on a wide range of Chinese goods, targeting what it deemed unfair trade practices, intellectual property theft, and technology transfer. Inevitably, China retaliated with similar tariffs on US goods, escalating the trade tensions between the nations. This tit-for-tat tariff war escalated through 2019 
as if this year needed any more trouble, and yeah, 2019 was not a good year for the Sino-American relations. You can practically take your pick of what caused more chaos. Was it the arrest of Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, at the request of the US? Or perhaps it was his subsequent lawsuit against the US? Of course, the onset of COVID-19 is also a strong contender, one that will wreak havoc even on the international perception of China and the US for years to come. During this period, there was one tension-building move after another, as if there was any further room for additional escalation. In 2020, the Trump administration barred foreign nationals who had recently visited mainland China from entering the US, clearly demonstrating who it blamed for the pandemic. Though it was probably already pretty clear by President Trump repeatedly referring to COVID-19 as the, quote, Chinese virus. Abandoning the blame game for a while, we have to mention other incidents taking place in 2020 that weren't related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, not officially at least. In March, the Chinese government expelled at least 13 US journalists from three major publications, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post, even though their press credentials were still valid. In July, the US ordered China to close its Houston, Texas consulate, citing efforts to combat espionage and intellectual property theft taking place there. That same month, US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo delivered a speech blasting China on several accounts, all of which we've already covered signaling a profound shift in the U.S. policy toward China. This sentiment persisted until Senator Pompeo and Donald Trump's very last day in office. Interestingly, and perhaps surprising to some, it also partially persisted even after President Joe Biden took office. From NATO declaring China a, quote, security challenge and a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics, to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taipei and the U.S. Commerce Department's sweeping restrictions on computing chip exports to China, it became clear 2022 wasn't about to bring any good news for the strained US-China relations. Now we've come full circle back to 2023 and the infamous Chinese spy balloon incident that demonstrated that the future trajectory of Sino-American relations remained turbulent and, perhaps worse, unpredictable. But let's not think about the future just yet. For now, let's stay in the present. What, if any, challenge does China pose that would make the US anxious? Well, given how much the US-China relations have expanded, the answer to this is anything but simple. Let's address some of the common opinions about China's stance toward the US and the world, as well as the truth behind them. Bringing the temperature back up, we'll start with the idea that China intends to displace the US as the world's dominant military power. Given China's combat record, it's safe to say most countries are apprehensive about that possibility. If you're among the fearful ones, we've got bad news. China has the largest army in the world, the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, with over 2 million active personnel. This figure also includes the largest navy in the world by total number of warships and submarines, and that's not to mention its nuclear second strike capability owing to modernization efforts kickstarted by President Xi. Even though those staggering figures undoubtedly give China military dominance in Asia, they don't automatically guarantee global dominance over the US. Granted, China's military superiority in its immediate periphery is no less troubling as it jeopardizes the US's ability to support its allies and operate freely in the Indo-Pacific region. However, focusing on its military power is seemingly not China's preferred means of achieving global dominance. This honor belongs to its economic initiatives, technological advancements, diplomatic engagements, and information warfare. So let's break down each of those components. On the economic front, China has managed to become the world's second largest economy, just behind the US, and closing the gap at a rapid pace. Though the difference between the country's GDP is still significant, the US is undoubtedly feeling the pressure. But there's no need for this, at least for another decade or two. You see, Bloomberg Economics, which initially suggested China will surpass the US as the world's largest economy by 2027, is currently not positive about the country's future in that regard. The supposed switch might happen in the mid-2040s, and even then it won't last long. As for technological advancements, the US has consistently tried to cut China out of key supply chains altogether, fearing its dominance in the field. But the truth is, such moves could potentially harm the US in the future and cause disruption to the global economic order. Especially when you consider China's willingness to do business with virtually anyone. This brings us to the next part of China's strategy, strong diplomatic relations. China's advocacy for a multipolar global order, where non-Western countries have more of a say in global matters, has been received quite well in the developing world. As a Western nation, the US obviously has to navigate its response carefully. Explicitly warning other countries against working with Beijing is certainly not the right move, 
building soft power is the way forward. This entails delivering resources and helping the developing countries address their grievances, thus fostering international goodwill, which will go much further than straight-up isolating China. However, it's important to note that China does a pretty good job of isolating itself all on its own. After all, there are only so many coercive tactics China can use in countries like Vietnam before the public opinion toward it declines sharply. Naturally, this is the exact opposite of what China wants to accomplish on a global scale. That's why it relies on information warfare so much. Taking after its communist partners in crime, Russia, China has been actively employing information warfare tactics to gauge Western nations' responses to a potential forceful expansion in the Asia-Pacific region. In addition, China has been persistently trying to reshape the global power dynamic in its favor without firing a single shot. Well, in the traditional sense at least. After all, today's weapons of disinformation through owned foreign media, cyber attacks, and social media manipulation can even be more powerful than a military arsenal. Just take the way state-run media in China reports on the US internal affairs. If you were to turn on the CCTV, China's central television, or CGTN, China Global Television Network, after a notable event, you'd likely witness a carefully curated narrative aimed at shaping perceptions of the US in China and beyond. With these propaganda outlets, it's all about gun violence, suicide rates, and drug use in the US, as well as human rights violations. They're particularly fond of the last one, as they love to present these violations as double standards on the US's behalf. Something along the lines of, hey, you can't stop us from committing human rights violations if you're also doing it. But try as they may, China is highly unlikely to displace the US as a leading world power, thus also keeping a potential escalation of the Cold War at bay. Let's explore some of the US's geopolitical advantages over its rival for global dominance to see why this escalation seems unlikely. First and foremost, let's talk geography. Given its history in the region, it's safe to say China isn't surrounded by the friendliest neighbors. In fact, the country currently has territorial disputes with several countries, including India, Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam, Malaysia, the Philippines. All that surrounds the US are two oceans and friendly neighbors to the north and south. Next, it's energy's turn. In recent years, the US has gone from energy importer to an exporter, thanks to the so-called shale revolution. The revolution in question refers to advancements in fracturing and drilling that enabled the US to drastically increase its oil and natural gas production. China, on the other hand, is still very much dependent on energy imports passing through the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. Any guesses about which country has naval supremacy in those regions? Let us help you. Its abbreviation starts with a U and ends with an S. The US even has a strong demographic advantage, as its workforce is expected to grow over the next decade. China's will likely shrink. The same goes for the general population, which can severely limit its future power. After all, the country has already lost the title of the world's most populous country to India in April 2023. But let's bring it back to the workforce aspect for a second. The US is training some highly skilled tech experts at its research universities, many of which are also considered the best universities in the world. With no Chinese university coming close, it's obvious that the US will be able to remain at the forefront of technological advancements, despite China's rapid progress. So, Chinese leaders can spew the East is rising and the West is declining rhetoric all they want. All the facts point to the contrary. And as long as the US remains a dominant force worldwide, the Cold War between the countries should remain just that, cold, thus averting global chaos. Of course, avoiding a global conflict is in the best interests of all countries not just the US and China, but it's important to note that this we-should-all-get-along notion rests on incredibly fragile foundations. One American plane shot down by the Chinese Navy, or one miscalculated move in the South China Sea, and it could all go out the window. Even Spy Balloon Saga 2.0 could shatter this delicate piece. That's why ending the Cold War before it can escalate, or at least lowering the tensions, is the ideal solution. Naturally, this would entail Washington and Beijing working out a coexistence that benefits both parties. Even the country's leaders shared the sentiment during their second meeting as presidents in November 2023. President Xi was even quoted as saying, Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. This apparent thaw in the US-China Cold War reignites hope that with some compromise, time, and responsible leadership, the worst-case scenario aka the complete and utter chaos we mentioned in the beginning, could be avoided. But what about you? How do you think this new Cold War will end? Share your theory in the comments section below. Now check out what would happen if China and the US went to war hour by hour, or watch why China's artificial islands are now sinking.